the labyrinth, walk in the path of the arch. Will you be so kind as to let me indulge in an act of wild speculation for a moment? To connect some dots, even if they remain fanciful. To ask a simple question and see where it leads. It may be helpful later on, but just remember, it's only speculation. For now. Could there exist a cathedral in Antarctica? We have a growing conundrum, a puzzle forming before our eyes. What is the connection between water, sound, and the telluric currents, and their relationship to these medieval structures? Could it be that baptism has a lost or hidden history, and that the living waters were truly restorative and healing? Or that monastic agricultural farmers were actually utilizing electroculture to grow their crops? Or perhaps it's always been one of the best kept secrets, as our French writers suggest, of the initiated alchemists. The path of the arch. Architecture is an interesting word. It stems from the Greek architecton, which directly translates as chief or master builder. Archi or archon meaning chief and tecton meaning builder. But what's so pertinent is the presence of the word arch in architecture, for it is the master builder who builds in the language of arches, rounded arches, pointed ogival arches, parabolic arches. And what about the highest of master builders, the Lord God of this world we find ourselves in? He also builds in the language of arches. From our perspective, the celestial hemisphere above takes the form of an arch, or an arc, the luminaries rising from the east and setting in the west. Wherever we go in the world, the celestial arch rotates above our heads. The most beautiful of arches, this life and world the most difficult of labyrinths. One of the most striking aspects of old world architecture is its relationship to the sun and stars. The majority of medieval ecclesiastical structures are cardinally aligned. The choir is deliberately situated in the east and the nave in the west. Why? Chartres Cathedral on the summer solstice, at precisely midday, a ray of sunlight comes through a small space in the stained glass window and strikes a particular stone in the transept. Why? There is also a long history of astronomers using cathedrals to construct meridianas, a meridian line that runs from south to north in a large dark space or building with a hole in its roof and allows one to track the shifting noon position of the sun. It seems that almost all civilizations and cultures, at some point in history, built their structures to align with the sun and stars. There are Egyptian obelisks, which are, in essence, just huge sundial gnomons. Pyramids with chambers that align with the heavens, with architectural features that cast specific shadows on specific dates. Buried spaces and mounds that interact with solstices, temples that dance with the equinoxes. And perhaps the medieval cathedrals interact with the sun and stars in ways not yet acknowledged. Do the spires act as huge sundials? Or are there other tricks like this that cast peculiar shadows and light at specific times and dates? Do the cathedrals align with particular constellations? And why do so many structures all over the world from all different eras and societies align with the luminaries? Was it primarily just to track time and keep calendars? Or were our ancestors also monitoring or observing something else? All good questions. The problem is, what if we've only received half of the story or less? Could there exist a cathedral in Antarctica? Well, that depends on how you define cathedral. If a cathedral is a church, it contains the seat of a bishop and serves as a central hub for a diocese, then no, there is not one in Antarctica. 
If a cathedral is a hollow, geometric space for the musical vibrations of the organ and bells to dance in communion, then no, there is not one. If a cathedral is a place for the worship of God, then perhaps there is one. Just perhaps. And it depends what God we are referring to. But if we go with another definition, that of the cathedral as an astronomical observatory, a space to monitor and track the movements of everything and anything celestial, then yes, there could very well be a cathedral in Antarctica. It's right here. Can you not see it? No, of course you can't, because it's buried beneath your feet. Ice Cube Extending to a depth of 2,500 kilometers and spreading across a cubic kilometer of space, Ice Cube is an underground telescope or neutrino observatory. It's a recognized CERN experiment and its function is to search for neutrinos. Neutrinos are almost massless particles with no electric charge and that travel from their sources to Earth without being disrupted by magnetic fields. Ice Cube also works to detect, monitor and understand air showers from primary cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are the highest energy particles ever observed. They primarily originate from our sun and their particles can pass through the ground. In fact, there are many types of rays or streams of charged particles that originate from the sun, such as solar wind, which also influences activity within the Earth's surface. Solar wind has a key role in generating the telluric currents. But before the religion of science sought to build its astronomical cathedrals under the ice deserts of Antarctica, and the laboratory priests worshipped their particle gods under the ground, there were others who spoke of these rays and winds. The sun is born of fire, Fire is the soul of the Great Whole. Its elemental atoms pour and stream continuously over the world in infinite currents. At the points where the currents intersect in the heavens, they produce light. At their points of intersection within the earth, they produce gold. Light, gold, the same thing. Fire in its concrete state. The difference between the visible and the palpable, the fluid and the solid, from steam to ice, that's all. Cosmic rays were discovered at the turn of the 20th century and solar wind in 1957. But, writing his novel 100 years before this in 1830, it appears that Victor Hugo already knew very well of these elemental particles that pour and stream continuously over the world in infinite currents. He calls these currents the fire, the soul of the great whole. And according to Hugo, this fire is not only responsible for the birth of the sun, but when the fiery currents intersect above, they create light, or stars. When they collide within the earth, they produce the metal gold. Not only does Hugo tell us that there is an inextricable connection between the cosmic currents above and the currents below, but his words on the production of gold are also ahead of their time. For now, scientists know that there is a direct correlation between nuclear fusion, cosmic rays and the transmutation of metals. They can even produce gold artificially in nuclear reactors and tokamak reactors. You see, alchemy never ceased. But what does this have to do with cathedrals? Ice Cube in Antarctica is not the only underground astronomical observatory. There is SAGE in Russia. There is LNGS, the largest underground research center in the world and located underneath the Grand Sasso mountain in Italy. There are neutrino detectors 2,300 feet underground in the Sudan mine in Minnesota. And the goal is always deeper and bigger. Currently in construction, Supple in Victoria, Australia will venture 2,900 feet underground. And in the small town of Lead, beneath the Black Hills of South Dakota, there is Dune. 
You take a 10 minute ride down a mine shaft in a mining cage, plunging 4,850 feet, deeper than a stack of free Empire State buildings, into June, and then the mining cage opens into a cavern the size of a cathedral. Basked in the white fluorescent light, characteristic of research laboratories, inside this cavern sits a 72,000 gallon water tank. Inside the tank, a titanium flask is suspended like a bell from a three-legged structure. A giant water tank. Why? Look at the Kamioka Observatory, which sits underneath Mount Ikeno in Japan. 50,220 metric tons of ultra-pure water. A lot of these detectors are just giant tanks filled with purified water and lined with sensitive photomultiplier tubes, which are basically just fancy cameras designed to capture the elusive blue flash produced by Cherenkov radiation. Every once in a while as these particles stream through the earth, a neutrino crashes into an electron and sets off a stream of offspring particles. If the crash happens in a material where the particles can travel faster than the speed of light in that material, they emit a streak of blue light known as Cherenkov radiation. But in order to detect this rare and random event, scientists and engineers need a material that is both packed with electrons as well as transparent to light so that the Cherenkov radiation can be observed. So what is both dense, transparent and available in large quantity on our planet? Water. This is why Ice Cube is situated in Antarctica. The ice there is particularly transparent and clear enough for them to observe the Cherenkov light. And what a beautiful and mystical colour. A truly profound hue of blue. Some might even describe it as Chartres blue. The celestial light in the water. And indeed, the litanies teach us that the Virgin is the vase that contains the spirit of things vase spiritual. On the table, at the height of the chest of the Meiji, there is on one side a book, or a series of gold pages or plates, and on the other side, a vase full of a celestial astral liquor, composed of a third wild honey, one part of terrestrial water, and a third part of celestial water. The secret, the mystery lies in the vase. Falconelli's cryptic words on the relationship between alchemy and the cathedrals are particularly interesting here. What is this vase full of celestial astral liquor, which is composed of one part terrestrial water and another part celestial water? He elaborates further, it's an occult agent, a secret fire, which, to give an idea of its shape, looks more like water than a flame. This fire, or burning water, is the vital spark communicated by the Creator to the inner matter. It is the spirit enclosed in things, the imperishable igneous ray imprisoned at the bottom of the dark, formless and frigid substance. Just as Victor Hugo tells us that the sun is born from the infinite currents, what he calls the fire, the soul of the great whole, Falconelli also uses this specific term, the fire. He calls it the burning water, the spirit enclosed in everything and communicated by the creator. And it is formed by an igneous, which means fiery ray, imprisoned in the formless dark. Formed from fiery rays, much like the particles of the cosmic rays, Falconelli then redirects his reader to consult an anonymous text, Precepts du Pierre Abraham, to learn more. This primitive and celestial water must be drawn from the body where it resides. 
The philosophers have given so many names to this water, and it is the universal solvent, the life and health of all things. The philosophers say that the sun and the moon bathe in this water, and that they dissolve themselves into the water, their first origin. It is by this resolution that it is said that they die, but their spirits are carried on the waters of this sea where they are buried. Again, we have an image of celestial water and its inextricable relationship with the luminaries. The waters carry and then bury the spirits or currents that create the sun and the moon, the celestial light. Did the ancients know not only of the telluric currents, the wuvir, that snakes under the surface of the earth, but also of the Cherenkov radiation, or what we will now refer to as the burning waters, the electromagnetic radiation emitted as the charged particles pass through water, illuminating it in blue. Is this the reason why many cathedrals were built upon old, Celtic mounds and go deep underground, sometimes with layers of crypts, tunnels and deep wells of water beneath? Were the alchemists of old observing and studying the astronomical phenomena beneath the earth as well as above? The primary reason scientists build their neutrino detectors so deep underground or underwater is to block out cosmic radiation. Just as we cannot see the stars during the day due to the sun's light, cosmic radiation acts similarly, preventing the detection of neutrino interactions. Constructing the detector under a rock or water allows scientists to separate the neutrino interactions from the radiation. It's a form of distillation, not that dissimilar to the proto-science of medieval alchemists, whose activities often focused on separating and isolating different substances and chemicals. And why wouldn't our ancient and medieval ancestors be aware of the telluric currents and have been actively studying and observing astronomical activity within the Earth? Maybe they witnessed the burning waters and understood that they'd seen the hand of God. Is it really that unbelievable and preposterous that the people responsible for devising, constructing and carving these geometric masterpieces were also studying the astronomical currents above and below? In the 1600s, Athanasius Kircher studied the forces under our feet and published a study, Mundus Subterraneus, in which he argued that there existed interlaced systems of air, fire and water within the earth. His diagrams and explanations mapping these underground currents and energy systems are very precise and thorough. Was he the only one to do this? Maybe we can never truly comprehend space unless there is a communal understanding of the celestial above and the celestial below. Maybe true space is a natural system of currents within Earth itself, and what we see above is a mere projection, a mirror of sorts. Is it a coincidence that the inner core of the Earth is just as hot as the sun above, as if there are two suns, one above and one below? Perhaps we've only received half of the story when it comes to celestial space and why all civilizations throughout history, no matter what culture or geographical location, often built structures to align with the sun and stars above. Could the structures also align to the celestial world beneath them? Could they have been observing and monitoring the activity of the telluric currents or other energy systems below their feet? Did this give them a better understanding of what was occurring above their heads? Did studying below help them understand the shifting position of the sun above over the course of decades and centuries? Or did it help them understand or prepare for something else, something bigger? Our Lady of Under the Earth, the Virgin. Falconelli asserts that the Virgin is a vase containing the burning waters or celestial astral liquor. 
Interestingly, Charpenter also uses similar imagery when he claims that the first thing was evidently to trace these currents to their source, in Earth herself, in the cavern, or again by usage of the water that was impregnated with it. Once again we have an image of water coming from under the earth impregnated with some kind of current or celestial substance. The Virgin, the Black Madonna. Traditionally carved from a specific type of wood that darkened considerably over time, we are told. But there is a different side to the story, one that provides a different kind of origin. Scholars have traced her back to the Celts and Druids, but if the original statue in Chartres and in other medieval cathedrals dates from Druidic times, it cannot be a representation of the Virgin Mary we've come to know. No, for you see the Celts never represented their gods in human form. These statues are not the originals. What happens to wet wood if subjected to a strong electrical current? What colour does it turn? The next junction. Four doors, four different options. But before, electricity. It's interesting to entertain the thought that maybe we were never supposed to utilise electricity like we have. Just like the sun, electricity is also born of that tremendous fire that soul of the great whole, and perhaps it was always supposed to have remained exclusive to the celestial realm, and not harnessed by man for his own evolution. If electricity is part of that vital spark communicated by the creator to the inert matter, then that means it belongs to the spiritual realm. And if our ancestors were studying the telluric currents and the burning waters below their feet, then perhaps that's why they did it in the house of God. Electricity can establish a connection. How do we know that in utilising electricity, we didn't tear a hole in the fabric that separates our world from the spiritual world? How do we know that we haven't established a connection with a realm we don't properly understand? A realm of entities of who knows what intentions. Entities who may have used this connection to start developing their own artificial intelligence. Perhaps electricity was always supposed to be kept within the houses of God, where it could be kept safe by the adept and the initiated. Perhaps this is why our world is the way it is today. But I digress. Back to the four doors. We have four different options. And I think I'll pick this time. 